Well, what's going on, guys? Coach Joe, Becoming Lion Podcast here with the man, the myth, the legend, John the Mountain Dog Meadows. Uh, super pumped to have him on the podcast. Uh, he's a mutual friend of some other people that I know in the industry. And I was just talking about how timely it is to get him on this podcast because I've been diving into some bodybuilding style training more hypertrophy based stuff. Um, but to a lot of people, he is just such a uh, an, an influencer, and I don't use that word often, but an influencer in this space, you know, through his YouTube videos, through his actual career, uh, which just is just so much value that he brings to the table. So we're going to dive on into uh, his story, how he became the mountain dog, and uh, just kind of pick his brain on some questions. And I know you guys are going to get a ton of value out of this podcast. So uh, first off, thanks, John, for coming on making time for this. I'm really appreciative and grateful. And uh, you're someone that I respect and look up to just because of how you are as a human being, first of all, which I think, uh, you know, says a lot about people with you just being humble and kind and giving me the opportunity to kind of talk to you and get to chat with you. And uh, you're also a beast in the gym. So uh, thank you. And I'm excited to get this conversation going, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. For sure. So for people that don't know you, uh, you've been in the industry for quite some time. You got some years under your belt here um, with bodybuilding in particular. So why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself and kind of when you got bit by the bug? And uh, I'm interested to hear like your early stories because, uh, you know, being a young teenager, I was trying to get after it, you know, in my bedroom, had the pictures all over the walls of all the guys, uh, you know, that I grew up watching. So uh, I know I'll get some enjoyment out of it. So tell us about yourself, man. Well, I'm a, I'm one of these kind of unusual cases where when I was uh, 13 years old, I opened up a muscle magazine and I said, that's what I want to do. Um, <clears throat> kind of crazy for a 13 year old to think that, but um, I actually competed at 13 years old. So if you can imagine a kid in junior high school actually wanting to diet and lift weights and compete in bodybuilding, it was something that um, it's still kind of just crazy looking back at it. You know, I just turned 48 this past weekend and I never uh, really stopped bodybuilding and loving the sport. Um, I just loved it for um, what it is, which is just working hard and trying to develop your body and look like a cartoon or a superhero, you know? So at that age, I just immediately knew that's what I wanted. I started competing. And I was in a lot of different sports. I was in football, and and I sprinted and pole vaulted in track, and I uh, wrestled, and I even played a little bit of baseball. But um, <clears throat> bodybuilding is what I really, really loved. And I really loved it because I felt like this is something that, like in football, no matter how hard I worked, and I love football, but no matter how hard I work, Maybe the other people aren't as dedicated as me. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, but it was a sport where I felt like, now this is something, not only do I want to look like this, this is something that I can pour all my energy into it, and my results are going to be directly what I put into it. You know, um, And that's how I approached it, and that's how I always approached it, was what I put into it is what I'm going to get out of it, plain and simple. So I loved it from that perspective. And, you know, I, I, I never really stopped. Um, I did really well at an early age, uh, 20, 20 years old. I was winning open men's shows here in Ohio. And I got to the national level pretty, pretty quickly. And then that's where things got interesting. You know, I, I kind of had this attitude at the time, which was, oh, this is easy. I'm going to be a pro. No problem at all. So I went to nationals in 1998. And this is when nationals was extremely competitive. There were, you know, 42 guys in my class at that particular show. It was very difficult to get a pro card. Very, very challenging. So I went and I didn't make the top 15. I got my butt kicked. So it was like, hmm, maybe this pro card isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. And long story short, I actually didn't get my pro card until 17 years later. Um, 16, 17 attempts at pro shows. I think at least four second places, probably more than that. It seemed like a hundred second places, but um, it finally happened, but it was a long journey for me and um, a journey that I very much enjoyed. And I still train very, very hard. I enjoy it. It's just fun for me. 
So needless to say, I can't wait till I can get back to the gym and this quarantine thing. <laughs> with. Yeah, man, that that's crazy. And it's cool to see someone who's been in it for so long and is still so passionate about it. And we'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit uh, on what keeps you so passionate. But I'm just as interested when you were young, like who were some of the people that you had saw or like when it was that magazine, you were like, I want to look like this guy and like then what was the first steps from there like did you have workouts were there workouts in the magazine because now we have the internet but back then it's like i'm interested on how you kind of figured out this stuff yeah it was all magazines right so well what i what i loved was professional wrestling i love big time wrestling and <clears throat> there were a couple of wrestlers called the road warriors and um that's who i had pictures up all over my wall at home it was the road warriors so you may be too young to remember them. I don't know, but they were awesome. You know, they came out with these shoulder pads with spikes on them and painted faces, and they were very big and strong. One of them in particular, Hawk, looked like a bodybuilder. Huge traps. <laughs> he used to wear this thing around his neck, and he'd flex his neck, and the thing would pop off his neck. Oh, man, that was cool. Um, but there were, in, in professional wrestling, there were, there were guys that looked, in fact, many of them were bodybuilders. There was a guy named Tony Atlas, who was a former Mr. USA from Roanoke, Virginia. There was a guy named Paul Orndorff from Florida that was uh, really muscular. There was European guys. There was a guy named Ivan Putsky from Poland that was uh, very muscular. There were a lot of really muscular guys back then. And even The Rock's dad, uh, uh, his dad was a really muscular guy too back then. So when I opened up the magazines, it was just like that and then to another level. And the first magazine I got had Lee Haney in it and Rich Gaspari. And Lee Haney really was the physique that, like, if I could just wave my magic wand and look like somebody, I would really want to look like Lee Haney. He just had perfect proportions. He had perfect shape. He had – there was this picture of him standing uh, in the street, and there was uh, – uh, under this, uh, the manhole cover, there was some smoke coming up, and he was hitting a front lat spread and then a front bicep. And those were two, to this day, two of the most perfect pictures of uh, what I thought a human body could achieve. And then there was another guy named Tom Platts who had ridiculous legs, and that was kind of my other guy. Those were the two guys, very different bodies, but um, very, very impressive. And Tom was a little different, too, because he was incredibly intelligent. So I attended seminars of his, actually, when I was a teenager. And I remember um, going to an awesome gym, which I ended up training at World Gym East here in Columbus. And he, the, the grand opening, um, Tom Platts gave a seminar on a Sunday morning after the Mr. Ohio, which, which he had guest posed. And I, I want to say I was maybe 14, 15 years old, if that. Um, but I remember sitting in the front row. I remember Tom pulling up, a limo dropped him off. He, he has a suit and tie on. He walks in. He has a diet, can of Diet Coke. I remember he took a sip out and he kind of like act like he was hiding it. But as he was talking through his seminar, he was talking about sarcoplasmic reticulum and, you know, fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. And it was, it was apparent that he was really, really intelligent. And I really respected that about him. And it, and it really, um, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to learn anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and where muscles inserted and where their origins were, the nerve that innervated them. And I was really, really into that when I was a teenager. Um, <clears throat> and then he also had very good business acumen. So he was, um, he had a lot of thoughts on that. Now, the only way you could really know this stuff was from magazines, but fortunately I did see him in the one seminar and there really wasn't a lot of seminars back then. You would have somebody show up, um, and do like guest appearances. And that's actually how I met Lee Haney. He actually just signed a picture for me and, um, and so forth. But, um, there really wasn't seminars back then. There really wasn't the flow of information that there is now. It was just magazines. And so, and even that seminar with Tom Platts was only a two hour seminar. If I remember it was from like 10 to 12 o'clock that, that Sunday morning. So now we have, we're in this unbelievable age where we have access to pros and all kinds of information and so many different opinions and so forth. But, um, but that's, th those were kind of what got my mind spinning back in the day and what was motivating me and kind of, you know, what I looked up to. Was there any sort of uh, like training principles that you stumbled onto without, you know, if you, if you were here today, you know, okay, well that's progressive overload or, 
Like you can sit there and break down the science of it. But back then without those resources, were you just like, was there something you kept trying and you're like, ah, like I'm onto something here. And then like, now you look back and you're like, oh, duh. Well that, that was this, but back then you had no idea. And you kind of were just experimenting and trying different things, uh, whether it was with training principles or bodybuilding in general, um, with anything you go through, like with a prep or anything like that. Well, um, so the, the way that I trained was I basically just looked in the magazines and whatever routine that they said they did in the magazine is what I did. I didn't know if it was good or if it was bad. But one of the things I noticed that was different about Tom Platts was he appeared to train much, much harder than the other guys. Many more sets to failure, partial reps, things like that. So I – and and – and I also just love to push myself really hard. That's just, I could tell you stories about when I was in high school and junior high school where I would, I would ask the teachers, I don't want to sit in study hall. Let me go, let me go run around the gym. Mm-hmm. Let me do something physically hard. But <clears throat> I gravitated towards that, pushing myself really, really hard. And I probably did a little too much, but I can tell you this, I did progress very well. Um, as a teenager, I ended up squatting, you know, I was over 500 pounds as a natural teenager. Um, and and really what my philosophy was, was around Tom Platz's, which was, he was a little, he had a, he had a methodology, he had a methodology. Um, but my methodology was just, I'm going to push myself as hard as I can. That was my, that was my philosophy. Now that can be the case throughout the nineties in particular, where we, we all trained really hard. And if you, back in the 90s, there was never really any talk of overtraining and this overtraining boogeyman didn't really exist. It was how hard could you push yourself? And you, of course, you hear stories about people training for two, three hours of time, all this stuff. But I pushed really, really hard. And it was very, very effective for me. It was very effective. I had many training partners that trained really, really hard. Some guys were natural, some guys weren't natural, but they all made really good progress. So we came into this, uh, you know, I, I'm obviously very keen on following a lot of the guys on the scientific side of the sport now. And I read everything they write and, you know, the Brad Schoenfelds and Scott Stevenson's and Mike Israel's, and I read all this stuff and I keep up with it. And I would say, I, I don't know when exactly I could pinpoint it. Maybe somewhere between five and 10 years ago, there started to be all this discussion around how hard you should really train. And to be, to be completely honest with you, I think it's taken the sport backwards. Um, I think a lot of people would say we're smarter now. And I agree in some cases, like for example, I just finished writing a program for beginners in that program, I have zero sets taken to failure over the entire 12 weeks. You know, there's this continuum where the further you approach your genetic potential, the more you have to kind of work hard. You just have to. Results don't come easy. So the question becomes, how do you intelligently do that? Now, I'm 34, 35 years in training now, training really, really hard, and I think I've figured out a lot of ways that you can do that intelligently and not hurt yourself. Most of the guys that I know that trained really hard that didn't do it very intelligently are having back surgeries, shoulder surgeries. I haven't had any surgeries. So I think I have figured out along the way many different things that you can do that allows you to continually train hard and push yourself, but you don't get hurt. So now there's, I see a lot of kind of this, this um, thought that you don't really need to train that hard. Leave several reps in a tank on all your sets, and you'll get to where you need to be. And it's ironic because I see these same people preaching progressive overload. So I, I'm like, okay, I want you to think about this. You're saying on one hand, leave three reps in the tank on all your sets. And on the other hand, you're saying practice, practice progressive overload. Like the last time I checked, when you keep adding reps and weight, it eventually gets hard to do that. So at some point, you're going to have to approach failure, Right. Now, I think there's an intelligent way to do it, and I've I have spoken about that many times very clearly on how I think you should do that. But I think the bottom line to me is, and to answer your question, what did I learn back then? It was to push myself. It was to go hard. And then as I got older, I just figured out how I could do it without hurting myself. But the message is still the same. Can I train now the way I could in my 20s? No. I've got to change the volume a little bit. I need a little bit more rest. There are some things I have to do different. But does that mean eliminating the hard sets I did? 
No, it just means being a little bit smarter about when I use them and how many of those I use. But the message of just busting your butt and training hard has never changed. And I'm so glad I was born in a time where that's what the number one goal was when you walked into the gym. It was, okay, let's see who can do it today. Let's see who's got in them today. It was very competitive with your training partners. And so I'm very blessed. I'm very, I feel very fortunate that I came, kind of came into the industry with that thought process and it never left me. It's just a matter of, okay, now how do you do it intelligently without overtraining, without injuring yourself? You know, and that's really the key. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because I've been smiling probably this entire uh, podcast so far because uh, I when I was young, I got in the gym when I was 13 and I pretty much was taken in uh, by a bodybuilder who's probably your age um, and he was a hardcore bodybuilder. I went to a bodybuilding gym and I'm the 13 year old, you know, surrounded by all these monsters, essentially, and I'm looking at them kind of like you're talking about how you uh, were looking at the guys and the wrestlers and that's what it was, man. That was the environment that I trained in. In. And uh, it's cool to kind of hear you talk about it because, uh, you know, yes, I'm very scientific with a lot of things and I have a lot of friends who are in the evidence based world. But at the same time, when I deal with people, they're trying to uh, not not everybody, but a lot of people kind of want to get to the science to almost see, see like what's the, the minimum I can do to get the, the result. And I get that. But at the same time, I feel like there's such, uh, you know, a value in just working your butt off. Like, you know, you can do all the science you want, but at the same time, if I have someone who's going to come in every day and just be hungry to get it and then put the principles behind it, like those guys flourish like crazy. Um, so it's just, I can't agree more with what you were saying about that because I feel like that needs to be instilled into people, uh, and kind of, you know, still have that culture or that environment, uh, which is, I, I try to do that in my gym for more like straw man and powerlifting. But I just remember being a teenager and uh, going in there, man, and these guys, it, like you said, there was something in the air, man, when you came in and it was like, we're showing up to work, you know, and uh, I've seen some guys doing some crazy stuff. But at the same time, like they were champions because of how hard they worked, and how hard they trained. Um, so, man, yeah, super cool. Um, so to kind of uh, move it forward. So you were talking about nationals and how, you know, you, you kind of had a bad show at nationals. So from that step forward, like what were some of the changes that you made, like moving forward, uh, getting your head, like in the right direction of, all right, this is what I need to do to take you to the next level. Um, how were you progressing? And then also maybe how was like the sport progressing as well? Cause that's that, like, I feel like there's been a big change probably from when you started and, and as you competed. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, that was a real interesting year. In 1998, I competed in nationals, and I was 197-pound light heavyweight, and the limit, uh, the weight class limit is 198 and a quarter. So I was, you know, right at the top of the light heavyweight class, but <clears throat> I got my pictures back because um, I was I was thinking, oh, there's no way there are 15 guys better than me. There's no way. That's bull crap. And then I looked at the pictures. Holy crap. There was probably 25 guys better than me. So it was a real wake-up call. And that wake-up call was, you know what, John? You ain't nothing. You, have, you might have won some shows in Ohio, but in the big, in the big picture, you're, you're a nobody. You can't hang with these guys. So I went back to the drawing board, man. I trained even harder. Um, I remember I was pretty strong back then. I was, I've got a video on YouTube back then where I was squatting six plates with a pair of sweatpants and a belt, just repping with it doing sets of seven to 10 every Saturday. Um, but I just pushed myself harder and harder and harder. And I, lo I locked down the diet a little bit more. I came back in 1999. So nationals was always in November. So 1998 in November, um, I think I took a week off and then I just went nuts. And I came back in July for the Mr. USA, which was the next pro qualifier out in Santa Monica, California as a heavyweight at 207 pounds. So I was about 10 pounds heavier and I was way leaner. And um, the limit for heavyweights uh, was 225 pounds, 220 or 225. And um, <clears throat> I was the lightest guy in the whole class, but I was still, <clears throat> excuse me, I was still 10 pounds heavier and way leaner than I was last year. So I thought, okay, I'm not the biggest heavyweight, but I'm in really good condition Maybe I can make the, the top 15 this time. That's the goal. Make the cut. Make the top 15. You, know, you put in all this money 
to to train, to do all this stuff, to 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 fly there, to get into a hotel. And look, here's what happens when you don't make the top 15. You do four quarter turns and you go home. You stand there, you face the judges, you do a quarter turn, you do another quarter turn, you do another quarter turn. This is how it was run back then. If they didn't think you were in the top 15, then you went home. Done. That's it. Game over. All that money you spent. So the goal was to get in the top 15. Then you could do your little 45-second podium routine without music so they could see you. Then they would start comparing you. So they announced the top 15. <clears throat> and I was in the top 15. I was like, oh, sweet. And I, like, I was happy. If I got 15th place, I was happy. I made the cut. And making the cut back then was a really, really big deal. Like, you could get – and actually, this is what happened to me. I'll get to that. But um, So I made the cut. So then they did the comparisons, and in the very first group of people, they actually called me out. And I was like, I don't think that was my number. I think they got that wrong. But they were like, no, you. So I went out, and I was in the first five. Um, actually, there were six people in that call out. But um, I was in shock. I was like, this is the first call out. These are the top six guys. I'm in the top six. And um, <clears throat> needless to say, I was incredibly happy. I ended up getting fourth place at the Miss USA so I went from not making the top 15 as a light heavy to in November to July of the following year being 11, 12 pounds of muscle heavier, making the top five as a heavyweight. And I just trained so, so hard um, for that and just pushed myself that I, I can pretty much guarantee you if anybody saw what I did back then, they'd say I was overtraining. But it was working for me. I was feeding my body good. I was resting good. Um you know, so it worked out, it worked out really well, but that was, um, that was kind of a big turnaround. Like that's one of the biggest turnarounds I've had. And then I, then there were times when I got into another law. I don't know if you know this about me, but in 2005, I, I had a rare disease that actually caused me to lose my entire colon. Um, it was taken in an emergency surgery, idiopathic myoentomal hyperplasia, the mesenteric vein. That's, those are the big words that describe what it is. So... <clears throat> Everybody said, you know, with no colon, your your career is pretty much done. And this was in 2005. So about 2008, 2009, I was somewhat somewhat rehabbed. I, I, I still didn't have abdominal function from all the surgeries and some other issues. But bottom line is um, I had another in 2011, 2012, I had another really good season of making progress, and I got back into the top five at pro qualifiers. So I ended up getting a bunch of second places, and I ended up winning my pro card. But um, <clears throat> So there were a couple times. There were a lot of times in between where I thought, man, I don't know if I'm going to be good enough to do this. Like, It doesn't seem to matter how hard I work. It just Maybe I'm just not good enough. You know, That entered my mind a lot. But I thought, you know what? Until I'm completely convinced that I've exhausted every ounce of national of, of, of potential that I have, then I'm going to keep trying to get better. And I always felt like I can get a little better. I can get a little better. I always felt like that. So that's kind of what kept me going. And um, then surely enough, finally, the placings started to come around. So um, as this whole thing kind of started changing, I don't think many people know that you were working a, you have a full-time job at, uh, at this point, right? Not, not even doing bodybuilding, uh, which I just find fascinating. Cause, uh, I remember when I had heard about you for a little while, I was like, Oh man, like this is sick. He's a body. He's killing it. And then they're like, yeah, well that's just what he does. Like as a hobby now, that was a great uh, hobby. yeah, that, that's, that's amazing, man. So my question is, do you think, um, having, that normal nine to five job, like kept you super passionate about, uh, training because it was still a hobby. Or do you think like, if this was your profession the whole time, you'd still be as passionate about it. Uh, like I was just wondering that from like, I'm a gym owner. So like getting used to owning a gym after like being so passionate about training, it took me like two years to kind of like figure out the balance and get the right mindset for it. Um, where now, I mean, I absolutely love it, but at first I was like, dude, you know, if I go in a bit of a gym, I'm going to love this. This is going to be the best job ever. And then I was like all this business stuff. And, uh, I had to learn how to be a businessman very quickly because they're two totally different things. Um, so I'm just curious with your input on that and maybe how was working a nine to five with getting all this done? Like what, what does it take to, to get to where you were at with everything else going on in your life? And on top of that, dude, you had colon surgery. Like this is, poof. You're nuts, man. I love it. 
Well, so I was a when I was in college, um, I was a, a, I had a part time job as a trainer at World Gym, and it's an in person training. Uh, it was an in person training job, and I'm. I mean, this is the point in my life where I'm so fired up, you know, and clients would come in and they just weren't motivated. And um, I would try to get them motivated. Most of them didn't really want to train. They didn't really want to do much. They just kind of wanted to chit chat. And what I found was I would start training people at six in the morning. Then I'd go take some classes. Then I'd come back and train people. And I would work out in the evening. What I found was by the time it was my workout time, I was mentally exhausted. It was trying to continually motivate these people to train. So it it kind of poisoned me into being in the gym for a long period of time. I wanted to get in, just go, just go crazy, train hard, and then go home. Like I didn't want to be in the gym anymore than that. And and I I am 99% sure that's what did it. It was from trying to just motivate people and just you know, how'd you do this week? Oh, I didn't do this. I didn't. Do- okay. Let's train. Then like, come on, man. Can you at least try? Like it mm-hmm. got so frustrating. And, um, so I never wanted to own a gym because of the horrible experience I had with trying to motivate people. And, um, you know, now it's a little different. I'm in a little different space mentally, but, um, so that's why I said to heck with this, I'm going to get a corporate job. Because with a corporate job, I can work all day, just do whatever it is. It probably won't be that stressful. And then I can just come train. So I started my career in the, in the, actually as a recruiter, I work for a staffing company. And um, so, you know, if, if, if somebody needed, um, you know, like a computer engineer of some kind, like my company would find the computer engineer for that company. It was, it was a staffing company. So I did that. I did that for two and a half years. I did really well. And then um, I was working on a job requisition for a technology company. For I was, They were looking for a project manager. So, uh, you know, the cool thing about like being in a staffing company is you get to meet all these hiring managers. So you know who's hiring. Mm-hmm. All these companies are hiring, right? So I said to the guy, you know, I know this may seem weird, but do you ever think you, maybe you could consider me for that job? <laughs> So he looks at me, he's like, that's an interesting proposition. Like, do you have any experience at this? And I said, no, no, but I think I could do pretty well. So he's like, okay, well, let's talk about it. So he interviews me. And I apparently had the, the, the characteristics he was looking for in a project manager. I may not have had the actual skills. So he said, you know, I'm going to hire you. And then I want you to go get your certification. It was It's called a PMP, Project Management Professional. Back then, it was a really big deal. I don't really know if it is now or not, but back then, it was a big deal. I was the 20,000th person right around there in the United States to get it. So I got my certification, and they started me on small projects, and I kind of worked my way up. And then, um, and then I had a friend who was still in recruiting. He's like, John, I just got this uh, – awesome, awesome job requisition for, it was bank one at the time. Now it's JP Morgan Chase. He's like, I'm pretty sure these guys will hire you if you interview with them. So <laughs> this was, this was really funny. So he, inter- they interviewed me and they're like, so they call my friend back and they're like, yeah, we love him. We want to hire him. What's his salary requirements? So my buddy took my salary that I was making and he added $30,000 to it. And I didn't even know. <laughs> so he tells them, you know, well, this is how much money he needs. And they're like, okay, all right, that's fine. So he calls me back and he's like, yeah, they want to hire you. And um, they're going to hire you in at X amount of dollars. And I was like, what? <laughs> so um, and that began my career at, at Chase. I worked really hard. Um, I worked my way up the ladder there as well. I became a VP and running really large projects and, So here's what I'll tell you about my corporate experience. It was fantastic. And here's why. Because it gave me a disciplined schedule. So I got up in the morning at 8. Then I went to work. And you you hear all these people cry about, well, I'm in meetings. How am I supposed to get my calories in? It's really simple. You take that Starbucks, Starbucks cup you have. You put some protein powder in it. You put some water in it. And you shake it up and you drink it. It's called a protein shake. 
maybe grab a handful of nuts, you know, then I would eat my lunch. They had a cafeteria there. So I remember mostly I was eating shrimp and rice. They had a little Asian station and my little buddy was making me shrimp and rice meals. <laughs> then at three o'clock, guess what? Have another protein shake in your Starbucks cup. Everybody thinks you're drinking coffee. Doesn't matter. Then I would go home, I would eat, and then I would go train, and I would come home, and I would eat again. But it kept me on a schedule. Now, as I progressed through the project management world, it did a lot of other things for me. As a project manager, you have to manage large amounts of data. You have to see what's going on with this part of the project, what's going on with that part of the project, what are the issues, what are the mitigation strategies, what are you going to do? You had to manage a lot of information. Now, what do you do as a, as a coach, an online coach? You have to manage a lot of information. This is, you know, this is my client, Josh Wade. Here's what he's doing. Here's what we did last week. Here's his plan laid out. Um, here's the changes we've made over the last two weeks. What do I need to do now? And now I need a document and send times and then extrapolate that over all the clients you have. So it taught me to be very methodical on how to manage large amounts of data. So when I left the corporate world, I had the ability to work with a lot of different, I, I could handle a lot more clients because I was so much more organized from having that experience. And for someone who's never worked in that position, they probably just won't understand it. But when you've been in that position, you can understand it, like how it would help. So, and then as a project manager, you work with different kinds of people, right? You got people in legal, you're working with people in training class, you got people working in technology. So you learn to work with different kinds of people. What's coaching? It's working with different kinds of people. I'm not one of those guys that says I treat everybody the same because nobody is the same. Right. We're all different. And it's a skill to be able to communicate with people the way they need to be communicated with. Um, if you take somebody who just simply needs to be pushed hard, like like Josh, for example, Wade, he needs to be pushed. You need to you need to be honest with him. If I just said, oh, you know, just do whatever, Josh, you know, it's OK. He won't respond to that. Take somebody who's just the opposite. Let's say I'm working with someone who's a little more fragile. They can't quite handle the criticism you got to talk to them a little differently. There's nothing wrong with that. We're all different. So, you know, it, it allow, working with different kinds of people um, on something that high pressured. And then you have to make, as a project manager, you have to make decisions. And that's one of the thing that, things that paralyzes online coaches. Or people just trying to start their own program, for that matter. Forget coaching, just the individuals. They spend so much try, time trying to come up with the perfect diet to start. Like, no, just put a diet together that's reasonable and then just adjust it as you go. Get in the get in the game and start playing. And guess what? Even if you did get the perfect diet to start with, at some point you're going to have to change it, right? So project management does that. You get some information, then you got to make decisions. Okay, can we move forward with the project with this problem? You, yes or no? You know, you have to make decisions or you're just not going to be able to get enough information. So you got to make a decision anyway. So my point is, is that all that corporate stuff, it really, really helped me become, a, I think, a better um, coach online. And then, you know, factor that in with hopefully some knowledge I'll build up along the way. And it's a pretty decent combination. No, man, I couldn't agree more, especially trying to run my own business. It kind of throws you into the fire of having to figure everything out. You know what I mean? Like, and, and kind of like you said before, um, I'm just like you where the work I put in gives me X value of what I get out of it. So, uh, you know, I, I've learned so many things running my own business and, and dealing with people. And, and it's just, it all goes to, like you said, just to coaching or online coaching. And now when, when either say like, you know, something like this quarantine happens, you can either sit there and cry about it, or you can be like, how can I make the most out of the situation? Cause you know, someone out there is killing it right now, you know, and making the best out of it. So no, I, I totally can uh, agree with you. So with your bodybuilding career, where was it almost like the, the high where you were kind of like, all right, I feel like I want to, you know, be putting out video content. I want to start taking this online coaching role, you know, start a business, that kind of deal. Or has that always been a goal that you had or did you just like kind of just see yourself slowly getting there? Um, Cause you have a huge social media presence on YouTube. I watch your YouTube videos, you know, you have all your stuff, um, which we can talk about, but like, where was that turning point for you? Where you're like, I really just want to start pushing this. Well, um, it, back in 1999, when I got fourth place at that contest, <clears throat> I felt like there was an opportunity there for me to do something in the industry, but I didn't really know what it was <clears throat> because 
back then they didn't have social media like they do now. Um, I was active on some of the boards, um, the bodybuilding boards, but there really wasn't a lot of opportunities to make a good living. The ultimate was back then was to get a muscle sec, muscle tech contract and make 3000 bucks a mm-hmm. month. And, um, so I, I just kind of let it go. And I always felt like, I don't know what it is, but I think I could have done something. I was kind of the new guy at the national level. I think I somehow, and I had opportunities to move out to California to do that. And I turned them down. Um, and I always felt like in the back of my head, there was an opportunity I had to go out to California to, to be successful. And I just kind of said, you know what? I've got this great job at the bank. I'm making great money. I've got great benefits. I think I just want to keep on the conservative route. So that's what I did. Well, so in um, 2011, um, 2012, I was doing really well um, with coaching people. And even though I was working full time, I still had 40 clients. Like I kept my limit at 40. But that was very difficult to manage 40 clients and to have a full time job. It was very difficult. It was to the point where I wasn't really sleeping. And then guess what I did? I threw in some kids into the mix. We had a couple of kids. So we had a couple of kids actually in 2008 and I was working so much. There was a point of time in late 2011 where I just said, I'm going to blink and my kids are going to be grown up and they're, I'm not going to have been a father, nothing like it's going to fly by. And I'm getting a lot of notoriety now. I was writing for T Nation. Oh, I was writing for T Nation too at the time. Um, I was doing I was doing a lot. Like people were starting to hear about who I was and liked some of my ideas at least. So I thought, <clears throat> you know what? I need to make a decision. I need to just kind of forget the bodybuilding thing and just focus on my corporate job. Or I just need to get away from the corporate world and really focus because I couldn't be my best trying to do both. I really felt like I was capable of being a better better project manager at the bank, and I felt like I was capable of being a better coach. But trying to do them both was just, I was not using my full potential, I felt. So I came up with a strategy. What would it take for me to leave the corporate world and to go into this other world? The number one thing that I could come up with was, okay, what is it, what's holding me back? I needed to identify what the fear was. And the fear was very plain and simple. If, if, if I leave the bank and I don't do well in this industry monetarily, I've put my family at risk because I have a mortgage, I have bills, and guess what? Those bills aren't going to take a break, right? They're going to keep coming. So <clears throat> what I did was I knew that my mortgage specifically was one of the things I was very concerned about. I had been very good with my other stuff. I, my student loans were paid off. My cars were paid off. Um, I had no credit card debt. So what I did was um, I figured out how much money I owed on the house. And I saved and saved. Literally every extra dollar that was coming in from my coaching went to my savings account. And when I had enough money to pay off my house, I paid it off. So what I did was I kind of love telling this story because a lot of younger people have told me that they they enjoy it and they're going to go on that route themselves. But I knew I owed $196,000 on my house is what I had. My balance was. So I saved and saved and saved until I had $200,000 or was it 198? It was 198,000. So I walked into the bank on a Saturday and um, I said, I need to wire $198,000 to Wells Fargo. (laughs) They're like, what? (laughs) So, I sat down, I wired Wells Fargo the money. I walked out of the bank now with only $2,000 in my name, but my house was paid off. So no matter what happened, my kids are going to have a roof over their heads. My family is going to have a roof over our heads. And that was really the catalyst that allowed me to be calm and to know, okay, everything's going to be okay. I don't expect probably to make as much money as I was at the bank, but that's okay. It's okay. And then it turned out um, the business really grew fast. And I, you know, what I made at the bank, I could make in two months and it worked out. But there was a real fear I had there. And I, for me, I just had to figure out what the fear was and overcome it. And it all worked out. But I think there's a lot of people out there that um, have a hard time making a step like that. 
There were some other things that I did too. I was very calculated. I said, well, I need a home base. Like I need a website. So in 2010, I had, I had the website built. Um, I started to think about, okay, um, I, have a, I have a business mentor, Dave Tate, who has always taught me about you know, just different business things. And one of the things he wanted me to do was have different streams of business, of revenue, right? So I, I was the first bodybuilder to do a, a member website for bodybuilding where you could kind of share stuff you may not put on forums or things like that. You know, so I was putting all my clients' diets on there that were, you know, competing. And I was I was working with some really smart guys, some PhDs, and putting really cool articles up. So I, I started that. Um, I got that going. Um, I went out and got a couple certifications, my CSCS and CISSN, just to show a little bit of paper clout, right? Okay, I'm not a complete idiot. Even though I have a college degree in this field, here's some certifications. So you can't just say I'm a total meathead. I mean, I am a meathead, but I'm not a total <laughs> meathead. Um, I can tell you what a sarcomere is. So anyway, <laughs> um, so I kind of did those things too. So when I left the bank, I already had a website. I already had a member part of my website, and I was already writing programs for people. And what I was doing back then, now people go to my website and they sell these programs I wrote. But what I was doing back then was every Saturday and Sunday, I would send to my clients their weekly workouts for the week. And it took me all day Saturday and all day Sunday. So I was basically working seven days a week, a minimum of 12 hours a day. And, you know, then I said we had kids too. So that's to give you a sense of, I'm, you know, I was pretty methodical in the steps that I took. And the approach I took, because that's just me. Um, but that's to give you a little insight of what happened back then in 2012. Then I left the bank and started this full time. Yeah, dude. No, no. I admire the uh, the hard work ethic. A lot of people uh, talk the talk, but don't walk it, man. Uh, and that's the reality of it. Um, so uh, some questions that I had from people. So I, I put up in my Facebook group that I was going to be doing a podcast with you. So I had some questions that the people had asked. And it kind of segues nicely because um, they were asking with your thoughts were on supplementation, like supplement, like the supplement industry as a whole. So it, do you have supplements that you sell? Or were you involved with that? So <clears throat> I've always been I've always loved supplements. Not because I think they all work. I've just, I've just always enjoyed supplements. Now, you know, it's funny. Like, I think about how I grew up. I grew up very low-income household, not a lot of money at all, but I always found some money to buy some supplements. <laughs> I always, you know, and, and back then when I was a teenager, it was all the Joe Weider stuff, actually even before that. But anyways, the Joe Weider had the Mega Mass 2000 bags or Mega, we called it Mega Gas 2000, right? So, um, but... I've always loved supplements, and the, my, the first supplement sponsorship I got was in – actually, you know what? I had a picture of it up here somewhere. I was going to show you the first ever advertisement I did. I think I must have moved it. But anyways, so um, back around 1998 or 99 is the first supplement sponsorship I ever had where I got free supplements. And um, the company – had an essential amino acid tablet. And I always, you know, just based on my knowledge and nutrition, I always thought, okay, I understand why people are so into BCAs, but why aren't they into EAAs? Why aren't they into the BCAs plus the phenylalanine, the, hist the, the, the histidine, all these other essential amino acids so that they actually have the substrate to actually grow muscle? So I was always in my mind asking these questions and kind of playing around with stuff. And then, you know, I, I had um, I, I, I never really had a ton of different sponsorships because every one I had was many, many years. So and then I went to um, um, Biotest and because I was writing for T Nation, I started using some of their products that I really liked. And I got into the intro workout strategy and and I thought, you know, this makes a lot of sense from an insulin sensitivity standpoint, you know, you, you've got the mechanical stress of the training that's, that's increasing insulin sensitivity in the muscle cell. You've got, if you consume carbohydrates, you know, your pancreas is releasing insulin, which is going to attach to insulin receptors. So you got another, another way to shove nutrients in your muscle cell. 
So the, the relative sensitivity of your muscle cells when you train is really, really good. It's a really good opportunity to shove nutrients in. So I started playing around with my philosophies there. And what I figured out was all of a sudden I wasn't getting sore anymore. I was like, holy cow, this is crazy for, this is crazy for recovery. You know, then later, you know, um, many, many years later, you know, you, you could, you could see, and there's not a lot, most of the, most of the research is on pre-workout and post-workout. There's really very little that's done on intro workout, but what little I saw, there's some, some decent research I saw, um, that, that showed, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, a, a marker of muscle protein breakdown called three methylhistidine. And you could see in when somebody consumed aminos and carbohydrates while they trained, you could see that it was greatly reduced. And it's a marker for muscle protein breakdown. So, and it also manages cortisol. You know, insulin, a lot, a lot of people say oh, insulin has nothing to do with cortisol. Yes, it does. When you eat carbohydrates, the insulin response absolutely dampens cortisol response. So um, that became really one of my fundamental things about supplements I love was the intra workout strategy. And a lot of people don't agree with me on that. And I, and I can see why I, I know their argument and, and their argument is, well, you're eating all that stuff's already in your blood. I totally get it, but I cannot duplicate the recovery <laughs> by a pre pre-workout meal or post-workout meal that I can get with an essential amino acid powder, um, and cluster dextrin is really my favorite type of carbohydrate, but I can't duplicate that with food. And believe me, I've been trying for years. So, and the people that I've had use that strategy have, you know, I would say I have a, a success rate, I would say probably 90%, where people are like, man, this is amazing. I can't believe how I recover. So, when I left Biotest, I went to another company um, uh, called Prime Nutrition at the time. And you know, I brought with them my formulas for intra workout nutrition and I, I signed a deal with them under the premise I'd get paid a royalty. Well, they they um, sold a lot of it. They made a lot of money and determined that the royalty, they weren't going to pay me for it. So they, they stiffed me and, um, and then they started not putting the stuff I wanted in supplements because they wanted to save some money. So then I, I created a stir in the industry. Um, I Actually, I created a crap storm in the industry. And I said, you know, this isn't acceptable. So I left the company and I said, I'm just going to do this myself. Um, I'm going to do this myself. I know a little bit more about the manufacturing side now, about the supply chain, about fulfillment. I'm going to do this myself. So I started a company called Granite Supplements over three years ago. And um, it's based out in California, um, but um, it's a, it's a great company. So I do own a supplement company now. That's another one of my businesses. Um, I'm very involved with it, with the formulas, with everything, mm -hmm. you know, um, with, <laughs> with all people are amazed. They're like, man, you shouldn't be involved at that deep, deeply <laughs> level of the business. That's I'm what like, you want. This is, this is the business part of me, right? Because I made some mistakes where I got away from the business and then some things happened that weren't so good. Um, no, then we brought in some new business partners and we work, it's going really, really well now. I got a great team. The, the, the team is awesome. Uh, January actually was the best month we've ever had in our company's history. And then this virus thing hit. I was like, oh man, uh, like we were doing so good. You know, we're still doing good, but but honestly, we're down. Nobody's buying pre-workouts. Yeah. The protein powder is doing awesome. People love the protein powder, but you know, we'll, we've got enough, we, we um, have a, we have a very, we run very thin. So we, um, we don't blow a lot of money. We, we manage our expenses very well. So we're in a position where we'll be able to survive this and we'll be fine. Um, but I guess that's the long answer to your question. What do I do with supplements? So I have my own company granted that I'm very, very proud of. And, um, you know, that's just another, another thing I do that I enjoy. This is uh, a side tangent, but do you watch uh, Netflix at all? Man, I've been wa I've just binge watched Ozark. I was just gonna say, I feel like you are Marty Bird from Ozark because you're like <laughs> you're like involved with the supplement stuff. You know, you're you're doing your thing. I love it, dude. Um, well, interestingly enough, I'm evaluating a funeral home, a strip club, and a, <laughs> a, no, I'm just kidding. No, I know when you're talking, I was like, why is this Marty Bird just keeps popping up in the back of my head? I gotta say something. Um, no, no, dude, that that's awesome, and it's cool to see that you're authentic and that's why people are going to keep buying from you because they know what they're getting and 
once this is over, I guarantee you it's all going to be shooting back up. So a question, um, so say, you know, a guy like me, right? I have my training pretty much down. My nutrition's on point. Supplementation wise, what would be the recommendations that you know, or even we can talk about the intro workout. So I was actually talking about this last night with uh, my friend Dave, who, who has met you a few times and was talking about you. And that's something we're really trying to incorporate in my training is, is, uh, is more emphasis on the intro workout with the protein, you know, getting uh, all the stuff in my shake as I'm training. So maybe you can kind of talk about that and some other the big supplementation um, that you really recommend for people who do have, you know, their, their ducks in a row with their training nutrition uh, to make them a little bit more optimal and add that little extra edge to their performance. Yeah. So the, so let me, let me tell you where, let me start at a high level view on the intro workout nutrition. It, the harder you train, the more value you get out of it. So in other words, if somebody goes in a gym and they don't really push themselves, I don't really see a lot of value in the intro workout nutrition, but as you train harder and harder and harder, that recovery piece becomes more and more important. So when you get someone where they're training just all out, which is how I believe, you know, I think, I, I think I believe in training really hard. When you get, when you get to the point where you're training really hard, that's when it becomes really valuable. So when people put together their little pyramids and they say, you know, nutrient timing doesn't matter. I would agree with that for the people who aren't training really hard, but it actually matters a lot for people who train really hard. Like that little piece in the pyramid gets a lot bigger for those people. Um, you know, so, um, I like essential amino acids, um, over BCAs. Now BCAs are good and that's part of essential amino acids. They're not like two different things. BCAs are part of EAAs. So the additional EAAs, the other essential proteins that your body can make, they actually give you substrate to make muscle. So you don't have to rob Peter to pay Paul. You know, a lot of times we take BCAs, well, they got to find some histidine somewhere else, some phenylalanine um, somewhere else. So that's the protein content. Now, the carbohydrate content, I like one called cluster dextrin because it doesn't really spike your insulin. People talk about how they want to spike their insulin. Um, I don't like that because when you spike your insulin, your blood sugar plummets. So it's not a good idea to be in a workout and to feel great and then 10 minutes later to have a light sweat and you're going, and you're going hypoglycemic. The nice thing about cluster dextrin is it gives you a nice little lift in your insulin levels and, and, your, and, and you just kind of stay there. It doesn't cause this spike. So just from the way it's made, um, the way it's designed, there's a website called glico.com. That's who actually invented it. And you can see the, the, the molecular structure and the side chains of the carbohydrates and how they break down slowly instead of rapidly. And the, I think the reason why a lot of people have been disappointed with inter-workout supplements is because they took poor formulas. So when you're taking really cheap carbohydrates that make you sick to your stomach, because a lot of people say, well, John, they make me sick to my stomach or bloated or I have blood sugar problems. It's because they're taping, taking the cheap crap. You know, it's like, well, try some cluster dextrin and some aminos and let me know how you feel. Then they respond like, oh, my God, I feel totally different. Like it's, it's different. When you get the cheap stuff into workout, you do more damage than good because you interrupt your, your workout quality. A lot of times they get bloating. They get, you know explosive diarrhea like you got to have the right nutrients to do that right so mix in some electrolytes and then you know if you want to throw in the other goodies the creatine beta alanine you know that stuff which you could do beforehand um but that's kind of how i look and that's like to me that's the number one thing i do in my training it's i gotta have that i also am a big believer in fish oil we don't make a fish oil product but i do like the benefits of fish oil just on Managing inflammation, insulin sensitivity, just all the all the good data that exists out there for fish oil. I like a good vitamin D supplement as well, vitamin D3 specifically, especially being a pale white guy. You know, we pretty much are, if you do our blood work, our 25 OHD level is going to be really low for most of us white guys. So I think um, a good vitamin D supplement comes in handy too. Vitamin D is a very, very uh, good supplement. You know, low vitamin D levels can translate in all kinds of issues, depression, just all kinds of things, um, particularly important when it's there's no sun out. You know, if it's in the summer, you can get out in the sun. You know, if you get out 30, 40 minutes a day, you're good to go. But um, the other things I would say, um, so a good protein powder, 
protein powders vary very greatly in quality too. You know, they vary greatly in quality. And a lot of the ones that taste really good, they throw a ton of ton of sugar in them to make them taste good. Protein powders, I've noticed over the years that I've gotten a little more sensitive to them. They bloat my stomach. So I built one that's a blend of, of whey, concentrate, isolate, plus casein. Plus I have a little um, egg white protein and beef protein in it, but I put in digestive enzymes. I can drink it and I have zero upset stomach. And that's the major problem a lot of people have with protein powder is it's, it's, it, it upsets their stomach. They get gastric distress. And I've seen this more and more over the years. So, you know, I know that it used to be a common practice to spike protein, like with taurine and things like that, just to claim a high amino acid level. And I don't know that that's so much the problem now. Now I think it's the problem. They're just putting so many uh, fillers in it and sugar and stuff like that. I think it's creating a lot of the problem. But, um, you know, I'm pretty basic on my supplements. I like, I like curcumin to manage inflammation. I can see a direct result when I take it, when I me- measure my C-reactive protein levels, which is a great measurement of inflammation in your body it's always well under 1.3 0.4 so it does a nice job of managing inflammation which i need because i like my sugar i have some i have a little bit of a sweet tooth so uh, which can create some problems if i don't watch myself um <laughs> so those are kind of the main kind of the i don't i don't take a ton of supplements um, but those are kind of the main, those are the ones that when you ask me, just kind of pop into my head. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, now, is there anything outside of supplementation and training that you're a big advocate of just uh, to, for recovery, for managing stress, like anything like that? Like, would you add on to that outside of the gym? Well, uh, so I think sleep has been talked about as much as I've ever heard ever. I, I have a whole section of whole set. And when I do seminars, I have a a part where I talk about sleep and sleep cycles and um, circadian rhythms and sleep drive and all this stuff. So sleep's very important. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at the data out there on sleep restriction, it's very clear that there are a lot of problems. Increased cortisol levels, increased ghrelin levels, decreased leptin levels. There's all kinds of issues associated with poor sleep. But I'll just leave it at this. You should sleep. But the other thing, which I think, is, and now more than ever, is just managing general stress. It's just stress in your life. You know, been in a constant flight, fight or flight uh, mech mode all the time is a very big deal. And like if you sit on Facebook for three hours, you're probably for three hours in stress mode <laughs> reading all this stuff. So I think just managing stress and your general outlook is – has a lot to do with a lot of different things. And like for me, when I was sick in 2005 in, in um, minutes away from dying and saved, saved by uh, emergency surgery, it really changed my outlook on what a big deal was. All right. So what I see as a big deal now is not what I saw as a big deal in 1995. So when you get a little different perspective and you realize that a lot of this stuff you think is a big deal, it's really not. You know, um, I think when you can kind of adopt that method and not be real offended so easily, I mean, on my YouTube, I mean, people yell at me every day, but I'm just like, okay, that's your opinion. And I'll just move on. Mm -hmm. You know, it it is what it is. So I think when you can just learn to relax and just not be stressed out, like I put that way up on the list for just general health, recovery, recovery. Um, and if you're stressed, you have a hard time sleeping. And if you're stressed, you may not eat. Like it ties into a lot of different things. So <clears throat> I talk a lot about outlook um, in my seminars too. And I have this um, one section that I really love to talk about where I have, there's four quadrants that you're basically in. You're in this positive quadrant where you're happy and you're energetic. There's another positive quadrant where you're just kind of calm and you're, you're happy. You're, you're um, content. There's a negative quadrant where you're negative high energy. So you're, you're ready to fight somebody. You're so mad, you're grumpy. And then there's another negative quadrant where you're calm, but it's more like depressed, like the world's out to get me. And if you can be self-aware, if you can know when you're in one of those four quadrants, you're always in one of them. 
you got to figure out which one you're in. When you're in the negative ones, you got to learn how to get out of them. I think being in negative quadrants is actually a good thing because it teaches you to respond. Um, you've got to learn how to respond to stress. And it's not reasonable for people to think they're going to be happy 24-7. That's not reasonable. But what is reasonable is to have the self-awareness to know where you're at in those quadrants. And if you're in, like, say, the, the high-energy negative one and you just want to fight somebody, the first thing you do is you figure out, why do I feel this way? Okay, what would get me out of this? You know, um, what, what are some things I can do to move out of this? And the answers are different from everybody. Usually it all boils down to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Usually there's a need that's not being met. Maybe that need is social connection. Maybe it's a need for respect. Um, there's usually some kind of need. Maybe you're not spending enough time. Maybe you're on the maybe you're in the negative low energy one where you're just melancholy and you're depressed. Maybe the reason why you're depressed is you don't spend enough time with your kids. So now if you say, okay, I'd be a lot happier if I could spend a little more time with my, my spouse or my kids. So now you build that into what you're doing. You take a step. And when you do that, what do you know? All of a sudden, you start moving into the positive quadrants. So <clears throat> that's a kind of an exercise I like to practice with myself. And um, there's a sports psychologist that I actually read a long, long, long time ago. That's where I got that concept from. And um, I think it's an awesome concept. You know, when you have that self-awareness, when you know where you're at, and then you identify where you're at and you try to move out of it, I think is a good thing. Yeah, no, dude, I, I totally agree with that. I think even uh, like as lifters, we have so much, uh, I don't know if it's yin or yang, whatever one's more aggressive on, but we, we are constantly doing that and we need to have a compliment to the other side to kind of help keep that balance. Cause if you're in, going one way for too long, you're either going to crash or burn. And it's like, you got to figure out how to just keep that ocean kind of riding steadily uh, instead of building a tsunami. Um, but I love it, man. But uh, yeah, dude, we're, we're about an hour and five minutes in time flies because I've just been sponging your information right now. I think you're super cool. My brain's going like a million different directions on things that we could talk about. Um, but I want to, if you're down, have you back on the podcast again to maybe go more in depth. Um, I was thinking something maybe on insulin because I really want to understand sure. insulin uh, and we can kind of really dive into that as, as its own podcast. But uh, before we wrap this thing up, uh, do you have just key pieces of practical advice um, for training uh, and, and life that you could give the audience? And, and I actually really liked the video you had put out recently about succeeding in life, I think is what it was. And you put out a couple tips in there. And if you remember any of those, you can feel free to talk about them because um, I think there was a lot of value in that, especially during this time, right? We have people who are isolated and they like don't know what to do. They're kind of freaking out. This is very uncomfortable for them. Um, so I feel like you could give them some words of wisdom and then uh, you can plug yourself and we'll wrap this bad boy up. Well, yeah, I would love it if you could link my seven ways to win at life video. Yeah. Um, that's the one you're talking about. Yep. And um, the last one I did too, my birthday, when I talked a little bit about my background, but that's seven ways to win at life. I've got a lot of stuff in there. I think, um, you know, appreciating your friends and family. And there's, there's a lot of good things in there that I think would really um, – when people ask me that, like the first thing that comes to my mind is always just be a good person. It's just be a good person, man. Like don't go trying to start fights and don't argue and don't think that you're right about everything and you, or you have to be right about everything. Look, I believe in standing up for what I believe in, but I'm not out picking fights all the time and constantly and like just treat people with respect, man. Treat people with the same respect that you would want. And now I have a lot of friends that we disagree on a lot of things but we treat each other with respect. Um, you know, so being a good person and treating people right is not, it's something that may get you ahead in life. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but you'll be able to wake up every morning and be proud of the person you are. And that's, what's more important. There's a lot of con artists, con artists out there that do get ahead in life financially, but you know, look at the dead bodies they leave behind and, in, in order to be successful and they got to live with that and some care and some don't, but to just be a good person. And as far as training, man, keep an open mind, experiment, like don't sit there and say, well, I'm not going to try this until I see a PubMed study that says that it works. You got to experiment. Like Mike, a lot of the opinions I have now on different things, it's based on experimentation. 
And the second thing I would say is you, you can never get this mindset that all of a sudden you know everything. I'm, I'm out there buying other coaches' training programs. I'm like, is there something I'm missing? I'm always trying to learn. You know, I love talking to guys like Brad Schoenfeld because I'm sure there are things that Brad picks up that I'm like, oh, man, that's a good angle. I never really thought about something that way. So I believe in trying to keep up with the science, but also being creative. Don't lock yourself in some box and say, well, I'm not going to try this until it's until it's evidence based and it's proven. Well, guess what? How does it get evidence based? You have to experiment. And then on the other side, if you're a guy who's, you know, um, you think you know everything and you don't want to look at the science, I think you're also selling yourself short. There's no way that you know everything, right? There's just no way that you can know everything. So look at the look at the guys out there putting out good science, and and you need to have a really good mix of the two. Um, but but I would say above all, man, you got to work hard. Don't buy into this. Don't train hard mentality. It, I can guarantee you, you won't reach your potential if you buy into that. Look, if you're a beginner, that's cool. Don't take anything to failure, blah, blah, blah. But at some point, if you really want to reach your potential, you're going to have to learn how to buckle down and train really, really hard. Uh, I always love asking this question. I feel like you're going to be a good person to answer it. So is there anything that... Uh, you know to be true that is not based on evidence, but you you just have this burning like conviction that it is true. Oh, there's a lot of things that I think <laughs> that I think, but I can't say that I know. Okay, I, I can't say that I know because if something because when you say I know. That means 100% of people will respond a certain way. Okay, then you th- let's go with think. We'll think on this one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so there are things that I think work really well. And a good one is a good one is for the guys who train really hard, the, the new train timing stuff. Like I always tell people like, okay, you don't believe in new train timing. Okay, I want you to try something. If you think meal timing doesn't matter, I want you to work out as hard as you can at nine o'clock, but I don't want you in, in the morning, but I don't want you to eat until... Start eating at two o'clock. Get all your calories in. Let's say it's 3,000 calories. Take notes the next couple of days on how you feel. Okay? Now, what they tell me is, man, I was sore. God, I'm sore. I'm aching. Okay, now, I want you to keep the same amount of calories. I want you to put a certain amount before training, a certain amount of after, a little bit intra, and then spread the rest out. Take notes. Tell me how you feel. Oh, John, I feel 10 times better. I feel... St- my workout was better. I didn't run out of energy. My recovery was 10 times better. That's what happens every time to people who train hard. Now, if they don't train hard, oh, yeah, I didn't really notice much of a difference. But when they train hard, it makes a huge difference. And that is one where I don't care. I don't care who tells me it doesn't work. When I've seen it work with literally thousands of people, then that's my evidence. In my opinion, that is evidence-based. Right. Because that's the evidence I've seen. I didn't just pull it out of thin air and claim that it works. I'm basing my thoughts on seeing something work over and over and over and over. And the other thing I would say is when it comes to the actual weight training itself, you know, there's all this focus on activation and loading your muscles. And that's great. We want full activation, which can come with heavy enough reps, you know, 85, 90% of your one rep max, for example, or, or maybe lower percentage, but going to failure. That's great. Um, loading, you know, you got to have enough weight to create some mechanical loading, but then there's a third part to that. And I call it activate load and exhaust. So once you start getting into the advanced side of this sport, it's, it becomes, you need to do more than just get activation and loading of the muscle fibers. You have to exhaust them. You got to really beat them up. And that's where I'll throw in a set of maybe a drop set or maybe a cluster set here and there. That's when I'll throw in those kinds of techniques. And I've seen some of the studies came out. There was a few that came out that said, well, drop sets from what we see do the same thing. Like if you did three sets and like one and made a drop set, it would be the same as doing one set, two set, three sets separately. Um, But I would say this, I really feel like when you get to that advanced level, that exhausting the muscle fibers and really pushing them hard is a way to create progressive overload because you can do progressive overload in the form of extra weight or reps when someone's an intermediate or they're a beginner. But guess what? 
haven't you noticed that not everybody continues to get stronger the rest of their life? At some point, you just can't. Mm -hmm. You just can't get stronger the rest of your life. And I don't understand why people can't grasp that concept. At some point, your tendons and your connective tissue is not going to be able to handle the extra weight, or you're just not capable of getting stronger, or every one of us, by the time we're 50 years old, will be benching 1,000 pounds. So how do you keep getting better then? Some people say, well, then you can't get any better if you can't get stronger. That's BS. I've seen it over and over and over, guys who don't get stronger, but they get much more muscular. And it's because they exhausted muscle fibers. They really worked them hard. They, they, they activated, they loaded, and then they just pounded the living daylights out of muscle fibers. You know, I was at my peak squat strength in 1995. I was squatting around 800 pounds. Um, I was never able to do that again after that, you know, um, but my legs got another two inches bigger. Um, I could give you story after story. And if you just think about it from a powerlifting perspective, I trained at Westside Barbell, you know, with the strongest guys in the world. Some of the guys weren't real big. They like if you saw them out on the street, you wouldn't say, nah, that guy can't bench 600 pounds. But they could because they mastered maximal strength training. They they activated and they loaded they would do their sets of three. They do their dynamic work with Louie. They do their maximal strength work with Louie. Then there were other guys that were massive, that were big dudes, like Chuck Vogelpool, for example. And Chuck did a lot of extra training, like bodybuilding training. And Chuck, Chuck trained really hard. To this day, Chuck is the biggest animal I've ever seen in the gym. Chuck was an animal. He would out-train anybody. <clears throat> so if all it took was heavy weights – then why aren't all these guys now that are deadlifting 800 pounds, why aren't they massive? They're not. They, they've just got good leverages, their limb lengths. Moving, moving extra weight is awesome. It's great. But there will come a time when you can't just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's when you've got to buckle down and learn how to really handle pain. And I mean good pain. I don't mean injury pain. I mean work through pain, drop sets, cluster sets. And that's what's helped me a lot and a lot of the people I work with is is kind of um and it's not I don't think it's real accepted in the scientific community. They just think, well you don't need to do that. That's too much. There's no benefit to it. Well you know I wouldn't have an I wouldn't have a beginner do what I do. I wouldn't have an intermediate do what I do, but I sure would heck have my advanced people do it. You know? Um so that would be that would be the other thing I would mention in terms of training is 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 it's probably not really scientifically um, accepted that those high intensity techniques bring a lot of value, but they do to somebody who's trying to get the last 20% of their potential, you know, and is it necessary for beginners? No, I would never have a beginner do stuff like that. But again, as you get on that course to your potential, then you've got to really think about, okay, how can I destroy my muscle fibers without, without injuring myself? Cause at some point it's not about how much can you bench. That how much can you bench, that argument goes away mm -hmm. unless you want to get injured. I have a feeling you're going to be around for a long time, John. <laughs> Our last I question. So. Yeah, no, you will. You will. And you're going to be jacked and looking amazing. And all these these nerds, man, they're <laughs> you're going to be uh, their arch nemesis. No, I'm just kidding. But um, uh, last question, I swear, I promise. And then we'll wrap this up is why the mountain dog? We, we have to cover that. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so I, um, I also used to show Bernese mountain dogs. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm a, I also used to play a lot of poker. I don't do that so much anymore, but, um, I love Bernese mountain dogs and my, um, screen name back when I was on the internet boards was mountain dog one because I loved mountain dogs. And that was it. It's because I love mountain dogs. I could have been Siberian Husky one or I could have been <laughs> German Shepherd one, but I was mountain dog one. And as I was writing back then, a lot of people would listen to what they would read what I wrote and they'd say, well, that's the mountain dog philosophy on this and that's the mountain dog that. And I never said that. It just kind of grew its own life. And people started calling my training mountain dog training. I never really called it that. But then everybody else started calling it that. So I was like, Hey, you know what? That's pretty cool because it's personal to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to just make up some kind of weird acronym to sound cool. I thought that's personal to me. And that's kind of how I've tried to live my life in business. It's just be me. If I feel something's pretty cool, I'll just roll with it. 
I don't, I don't sit here and think, okay, I got to think of some really cool acronym that makes it sound like I'm really smart, you know? And people are like, John, you don't want to say mountain dog training because people are going to Google you and they're just going to see pictures of mountain dogs. I said, you know what? I don't care. If they want to get to me, they'll find me. It's all right. And I think it's worked out okay for me. Um, but that's where it came from. Oh, that's cool, man. I, I definitely dig it. I love dogs. So more points to you, John. Um, all right, my man. So we'll wrap this up. I want you to plug yourself, everything that you sell, where people can find you. Uh, and then, um, we'll, we'll cut this one after that. Yeah. Well, I'm mountain dog one on, uh, Instagram and YouTube. Um, working really hard on my YouTube. We've been doing five videos a week now for three years. Um, this week we might do four, but we've been working really, really hard. Um, my website is mountain dog Um, I have a, the supplement company is granite supplements.com. Um, and I actually have a cell phone app called mountain dog diet where people, it, it has all that. It has 10 years worth of membership site information on there. It, it's got a ton of stuff. But it also allows people to ask me questions directly for $30 a month. So basically, you can hire me for $30 a month, and I answer every single question. I'm, like, I don't have a team that works for me. They answer questions. I answer every one of them directly. So I always tell people, you know, if somebody was a lawyer or whatever, I mean, to be able to ask them as many questions as you want for $30 a month is pretty cheap, right? When mm -hmm. I tell them that, they're like, man, now that you mentioned it that way. <laughs> So I do that as well. So I have granite supplements, Mountain Dog Diet. It's on. Uh, it's in the Play Store. It's on iTunes, and then um, my social media. Awesome, man. Well, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for taking the time to come on here, man. It really means a lot to me. Uh, I'm definitely enjoying picking your brain. There's a lot of value in things that you have said, and I'm looking forward to getting you back on where we can dive maybe deeper into the science uh, with insulin and intra workout, all that kind of stuff. Um, and go over that and give that as another podcast to the audience. But make sure you guys go and check out John on all social media. Uh, like he said, 30 bucks a month to ask this man questions is really reasonable with the amount of knowledge that you're getting for that. So um, I'll put everything down below for you, John. And then anyone in the audience, you guys can go check out all the stuff. I'll put his videos, YouTube channel, social media, all of that stuff. Uh, but thank you so much for getting on here, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.